Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's event. My name is Christos Kipreos, and I'm the research manager of the Bonavero Institute of Human Rights at the Faculty of Law of the University of Oxford. One important element of the Bonavero research activity is our research output in the area of business and human rights, also through our participation as one of the partner institutions forming the new modern slavery and human rights policy and evidence center. Therefore, we are delighted to be hosting today's event together with the Modern Slavery PEC and one of our partners in it, the Bingham Center for the Rule of Law, to mark the launch of a report analyzing the effectiveness of the Modern Slavery Act Section 54 that was produced by the Bonavero and the Bingham Center for the Modern Slavery PEC. Without further ado, I will now hand over to the director of the Modern Slavery PEC, and the Bingham Center for the Rule of Law, Mari Hunt, who will say a few words about the Modern Slavery PEC and explain the format of the event. I hope you will enjoy the discussion. Many thanks indeed, Christos, and thanks very much indeed to the Bonavero Institute for hosting tonight's event and for the invitation to chair this discussion of this very important and highly topical subject. And thank you all very much, members of the audience, for finding time in very busy Zoom diaries uh, to, to join us for this discussion. We're very pleased that so many of you can, can join us tonight. So the Modern Slavery and Human Rights Policy and Evidence Centre will by now, I hope, be known to most of you. It's a consortium of six partners, including the Bonavero Institute and my own institution, the Bingham Centre for the Rule of Law. And it exists to deepen our understanding of modern slavery and to use research and evidence to transform the effectiveness of laws and policies which are designed to overcome it. And the Policy and Evidence Centre is an initiative of the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and it's funded by UKRI's Strategic Priorities Fund. And I pay tribute to the Research Council's vision in seeing the need for such a body to address such an important challenge. Modern slavery and supply chains is one of the key areas of focus for the Modern Slavery Policy and Evidence Centre. And the report that we're publishing today with the Bonavero Institute of Human Rights uh, and my own organisation, the Bingham Centre, is a really good example of how research and evidence can help inform the ongoing efforts which are being made by governments and businesses to address the risks of modern slavery and to protect people from exploitation. Modern slavery and supply chains is, of course, a dynamic policy area. It's worth remembering that Section 54 only snuck into the Modern Slavery Act 2015 by the skin of its teeth. The government at the time resisted the recommendation of the Joint Committee that was scrutinising the draft Modern Slavery Bill that the bill should include provisions on transparency in supply chains. I was legal advisor to the Joint Committee on Human Rights at the time, and I well remember that it was only at a relatively late stage in the passage of the Modern Slavery Act that what is now Section 54 was introduced, too late, in fact, to be scrutinised by the JCHR, which had already reported on the bill by the time the government introduced its amendment. So we've now got several years' experience of the operation of those provisions, and today's report is an important contribution to the work that has been done to assess the effectiveness of those provisions in preventing exploitation in supply chains. The government has, of course, recently announced a number of reforms which address some of the issues which the research has found. And in our panel discussion later, we want to look forward to think about how these reforms could help to make the legal framework and business activity more effective at reducing modern slavery in supply chains. But first of all, we want to introduce the report itself to set the context for that later discussion. So our format for today is that we're going to be hearing first from two of the authors of the report, Lisa Sin from the Bonavero Institute of Human Rights and Irena Pietropaoli from the Bingham Centre, before introducing our panel of experts for the wider discussion and importantly, opening up to questions and answers from you all in the audience. So I'd like then first to hand over to Lisa to introduce the report, who will be followed by Irena. Thank you so much for that, Murray, uh, and welcome to everyone today. Uh, I just want to thank um, the Bonavero Institute and the Modern Slavery and Human Rights Policy and Evidence Centre for this opportunity and this platform to launch this report today. Also, to take this opportunity, I want to thank my co-authors, uh, Lise, Arane, Steve, um, thank you so much uh, for this wonderful collaboration. Our research assistants as well have been a huge help and also the, everyone in, in sort of pulling together this event uh, and the launch. 
So I also want to just say thank you to uh, three people in particular, Professor Leora Lazarus, who was really instrumental in creating this collaboration between Bingham and Bonavero, and Professor Justine Nolan at the University of New South Wales, and uh, Dr. Maria Yovanovic at the University of Essex for their contribution uh, at the early stages of this project. So now over to the report. Our starting point was really a, a question and quite an academic question at that. In the last five years, whenever we've spoken or talked about section 54 of the Modern Slavery Act, the question has always been, well, how effective is it? Um, because we often talk about how the law is a bit toothless and we talk about the fact that compliance is quite patchy. So we wanted to unpack that term effectiveness and to really figure out what it means in context, as well as uh, to see if it actually means the same to everybody. So in order to do that, we thought the first thing that we should do is to really consider what civil society organizations thought about this. And the reason why is because after all, that was the way the law was constructed. Civil society organizations were the designated enforcement mechanism of this provision. So we wanted to acknowledge the massive role that they have played in implementation of Section 54 to date. And we also wanted to systematically review their findings. One of the first findings that we had um, discovered through this review and is that civil societies really speak about uh, effectiveness in three different ways or three levels of effectiveness. There, it's not always clearly distinguished, but there is a spectrum of behavior which is considered to be effective. And so the first is really sort of technical compliance with the requirements of the provision. Then we have internal change within corporations, which can be motivated by a myriad of reasons, including um, the desire to avoid reputational harm, as well as to enhance efficiency uh, within the company. And finally, and ultimately, uh, the provision is designed to prevent modern slavery. So there is that as well. But effectiveness is very clearly linked to these specific outcomes. So we dived deeper and we wanted to look at how monitoring works. So monitoring is incredibly difficult, it turns out, because effectiveness is part of the link and it really helps us to not only understand um, and inquire more information, um, about how the provision is actually uh, working. It also creates this, enables a sort of responsive uh, approach to the piece of regulation. Accountability as well is very important because it contributes to the perception of effectiveness, which is important not only as a deterrent, but also in ensuring the right outcomes that I referred to earlier. So I would go as far as to say that when the government, as or when the government establishes a modern slavery registry, a monitoring plan should really be established alongside that. And in taking steps to enforce sanctions, then we need to make sure those sanctions have a verification step that is built in. So on verification, we conducted a deep dive, which was led by Professor Steve New at the Said Business School. Um, he will appear on the panel later on to answer some of your questions. But we compared two companies. We compared a company called Babcock International, which is a little known defense engineering company, and, a, uh, and Arcadia, which is the former parent company of Topshop. And what we found is that we cannot always rely on public pressure. So Pub Babcock International is a publicly listed company, whereas Arcadia is privately owned. Arcadia's modern slavery statements have consistently been ranked very highly, whereas Babcock has been shamed by not only the Financial Times, but also the FTSE 100 report published by the Business and Human Rights Resource Center and written by Patricia, who will also appear on the panel later. And public pressure really has been effective in raising awareness, but what it hasn't done is it hasn't been consistently applied across industries and it rarely affects non-retail or non-consumer facing firms, which can be probably attributed to the lack of resources available. So discrepancy between the performance of these companies has helped us to conclude that this level playing field that uh, we're so keen to create has not really materialized in the last five years. Modern slavery statements have become more sophisticated, but as a result of that, there are also many new ways of cutting corners such as limiting the scope of companies uh, covered by the statement. We know that Babcock International only incorporates 60% of its operations 
in its modern slavery statement and also outlining processes uh, without actually adhering to them or providing proof that they're being adhered to. For example, we know that Arcadia um, immediately stopped paying its uh, contractors and suppliers as soon as the pandemic hit. So we found that we can't always rely on the information that's provided by the companies. And so verification is very important, but there is no verification step that's built into the provision at the moment. So we suggest that it's time for Section 54 to be more outcome focused and then process oriented. So using the spectrum that I mentioned earlier will allow companies and regulators to focus on the result, which is what's missing at the moment and really accounts for much of the criticisms around effectiveness. On a theoretical note, um, monitoring and verification are exactly the type of ongoing activity that a responsible regulator would be engaging in uh, in relation to this type of light touch regulation. And in order to respond to context, we need more information about that context. So monitoring is not just an oversight mechanism. It's also a mechanism by which authorities learn. And civil society have had this mammoth task of overseeing and enforcing in the last five years. And this is a very healthy aspect of a well-functioning society, but the government must take steps to reduce the enforcement burden on civil societies now in order to, in, in, in order to increase the effectiveness of Section 54. So I will hand over now to my colleague, Dr. Elaine Petropoli, to say a few words on accountability and the comparison of corporate sanctions. But before I do, I should just say, this really is a whistle-stop tour of our report. Um, and you will find the report available on the Modern Slavery Policy and Evidence Center's website. And this was a pilot project. Um, so what we hope is that we would be able to stimulate further research and more research on this area. Um, but for now, I'll pass over to Irene. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Uh, thank you, and from, from me and the Bingham Center, a huge thank to, to you and the Bonavero team uh, for this uh, wonderful uh, collaboration, for this amazing work over, over the past year. Um, so just as, as Lisa mentioned, I just wanted to add a few points on uh, comparative regulatory models for uh, corporate accountability and enforcement. Lisa just discussed the, um, the empirical evidence that called into question the effectiveness of uh, civil society oversight model that we, we have now in section 54. Um, so if section 54 enforcement model is to be altered to promote more accountability, then we thought um, it was also important to examine what alternative models may be appropriate in this case. So as such, in the, in the report, as you will see, um, there is a part where we compare Section 54 with other regulatory models um, that are already in use to prevent, address, or uh, uh, bring about accountability for corporate arms. Um, so in that, that way, we explore the possibility and limit of uh, Section 54 enforcement. We, um, we evaluated a range of legal strategies already in, in use in the UK corporate re regulatory environment where actually the government role in monitoring business compliance with regulation is uh, much greater than Section 54. Um, for example, uh, we discussed in the report uh, the UK Bravery Act, uh, the gender pay gap reporting requirement, um, consumer protection law, health and safety regulation, also environmental law, as well as uh, uh, briefly also mandatory human rights due diligence regulation, such as the, the French duty of vigilance law. Um, and we believe after uh, this research that uh, the, the government role in this regulation, regulatory model, which ranges from, uh, for example, quasi administrative function, to investigative and uh, inspection function, also even to impose civil and criminal sanction. Mm, they, this, this government role serve as a very important role in holding business to account much more su successfully than under uh, the Modern Slavery Act at the moment. Um, in particular, mechanisms such as the health and safety executive compliance inspectors uh, fines uh, or um, uh, strict liability, director's liability, uh, prosecution, they all serve as uh, important uh, role in enforcing accountability 
and increase in the, um, the regulatory effectiveness. Unlike section 54, all the regulatory model that I just mentioned, uh, which are also used to prevent, address, and bring uh, accountability for, for corporate uh, arms, they do provide for some role of the state. Uh, that that's kind of our key point in monitoring, enforcing, and implementing them. So our conclusion is that section 54 is indeed unique and distinct from all other regulatory models that have been used so far. Uh, as it relies almost exclusively or exclusively on civil society pressure for its enforcement. Yes, um, it does provide uh, technically for the possibility of an injunction to be brought by the Secretary of State, but this mechanism is weak and in any case has, has never been used. Um, so due to this extremely light touch regulatory approach with little or no state intervention at all, Section 54 is not likely to be as effective as other regulatory models in, um, in securing legal compliance uh, and other uh, effectiveness. Um, there is uh, a, a clear need for uh, increased scrutiny under Section 54, uh, which we believe in turn will improve uh, accountability. So in conclusion, we find that enforcement mechanism for other corporate regulation of the offer better option for monitoring effectiveness of transparency and supply chain regulation. And we recommend so that the UK government uh, consider measure for section 54, similar to the other regulatory models that, that I mentioned already in use in the UK to increase accountability, bring about substantial changes in corporate behavior and uh, ultimately, which is uh, the, the, the key goal, prevent uh, modern slavery in, uh, in supply chain. Um, the government should look at what is already in place and often is working quite well uh, and consider similar measures for monitoring of the transparency in supply chain. This, this, this could be much, much easier to introduce than rather than trying to come up with something completely new, re re reinventing the, the wheel and starting from, uh, from scratch. That's all from, from me. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, Lisa and Irena, for that fantastic introduction to the report. I highly recommend um, uh, interested members of our audience um, read the report. It's a really interesting read. Uh, it, it really was the case, I think, when Section 54 was introduced, that it was it felt like a staging post. Um, the government was eventually persuaded that a completely voluntarist approach wasn't really going to uh, be good enough. Um, but what was introduced, it was known at the time, um, was a very cautious approach and I think we're now at the point several years later where we need all this evidence about its effectiveness and whether it's actually achieving uh, the objectives that the provisions were intended to uh, secure which of course is preventing exploitation in the first place so really valuable work I think it's also really important to be looking at other regulatory contexts for comparisons and that's where again research rigorous methodological rig rigorous research really comes into its own and it's really important that that is made available to policymakers as they think through the development of the legal framework so that brings us to our expert panel now we'd like to now shift the focus of the discussion to the future really we want to start a discussion for the remainder uh, of the event about where we go from here so we've invited our panel of experts to reflect on where we've got to with section 54 and transparency and supply chains measures overall but also what could be done from here to improve them and to tackle exploitation in supply chains much more effectively in the future. So we're very lucky to be joined by four real experts in the field. I'm going to briefly introduce them and then I'm going to hand over to them each. They get, they've been asked to, to spend just a few minutes offering their thoughts and reflections on that broad question. Uh, and we'll then go to questions and answers. So while they're speaking, please do in the Q&A box, um, submit your questions that we can then put to them uh, in the Q&A session. So our four experts are Patricia Carrier, Project Manager at the Modern Slavery Registry at Business and Human Rights Resource Centre, uh, who of course are very experienced in this field and um, the, the Resource Centre has published a very interesting report recently um, on the new Modern Slavery Registry, drawing on their own experience, extensive experience in this field. 
The second expert, Owen Johnston, who is policy advisor at Ethical Trading Initiative, also a great deal of experience in the field. Stuart Neely, uh, who is a senior associate at Norton Rose Fulbright and an expert on business and human rights. And Steve New, associate professor in operations management at the Said Business School um, in Oxford and also co-author or co-lead of the of the project's report that's been published today on the effectiveness of section 54. So those are our four experts uh, and I'd like to hand over please then to first of all um, Patricia. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me this evening. Um, huge congratulations to the team on this report. Um, I think the focus areas on um, effectiveness that you've chosen are very good ones. And so I'm, I look forward to reading the full report, but what you've um, shared just now with your findings very much align with what we have observed um, in operating the Modern Slavery Registry for the past five years. And my remarks will be based on that tracking of monitoring over the years. And looking at the reporting of um, the FTSE 100 companies, for example, example over a number of years and some large um, hotel companies, we've recently looked at asset managers. So it's based on reporting, not so much observations of what's actually happening on the ground um, or within supply chains. But I would say that, you know, looking at the three indicators you've chosen, which are compliance, um, changes in corporate behavior and prevention, I would say that ultimately Section 54 has, has proven to be quite weak in, in driving um, those three indicators. And as has already been shared with the authors, um, you know, we don't have any government enforcement at the time or at the moment. There is that injunction mechanism that can compel companies that are failing to comply and force them to do so that has not been used. Um, also, when we look at companies that have reported, um, there are some very basic minimum requirements that uh, companies should adhere to, such as having their statement approved by the board, et cetera. By our assessment, only 30% of companies are even meeting those very basic requirements. And that's not even getting into the substance of what's being disclosed, um, which again, we can say quite confidently that with the exception of a few, you know, what we call leading companies, disclosure is quite poor. It's very weak, it's very general you don't have much of an understanding of a company's operations and supply chains or their risks or what they're doing to address those risks after reading um, most statements. Um, and so ultimately, you know, we have found that a reliance on transparency alone, um, which is a very important tool for all stakeholders, um, ultimately wasn't enough to compel companies to change their behavior in ways that would help to reduce, mitigate, and prevent risks of labor abuse, including modern slavery. Um, and I don't think that the proposed changes that the government has recently announced will do very much to change what we're seeing so far. Um, and it has, uh, has already been mentioned, we did just publish a report last week that goes into this into, in a bit more detail. But ultimately, um, you know, it's important to, to note, I think, that most companies that are reporting do sort of follow the structure of the legislation. So the, the content of a statement is left up to the discretion of the company. Um, there are six suggested reporting areas. Um, so they are not mandatory at the moment. They will likely be made mandatory at some point. Um, but most companies follow that structure. They sort of divide their statements um, into those six sections the problem, in, problem is, again, that the information that's being provided just isn't very good. Um, so I don't think we're going to see much in the way of improved disclosure, even with the proposed um, amendments that are going to be made to Section 54. And so what we have found is that really, in order to compel companies to actually address issues within their own business models and within their own practices, um, there needs to be legally binding requirements and standards placed on companies. And of course, as has already been mentioned, these need to be enforced. So, um, you know, the Bribery Act has been mentioned, the gender pay gap, those two initiatives have enforcement mechanisms that are, that are used and they're quite stringent. And those types of measures have found to be very um, effective in not only um, increasing compliance, but also they serve as an, as an incentive to drive the type of practices we want companies to undertake. 
Um, in, in our case, we would hope to see companies undertaking human rights due diligence, for example. And this would look at um, all supply chains and operations, not just for risks of modern slavery, but also for all labor rights abuse. And we think that's really important um, in order to prevent more extreme forms of exploitation from occurring. So, you know, it's our position that asking companies to try to identify risks of extreme exploitation without looking at the sort of um, precedent abuses that come before uh, modern slavery or that might contribute to a risk of modern slavery from occurring is really asking companies to address this issue in a vacuum. Um, so we do believe that there should be legally enforceable standards placed on companies to look at all labor rights I mean, try to uh, prevent, remediate, and mitigate those risks that they, that they identify. Transparency would still form a very important part of a new law that would put those uh, requirements on companies. But of course, it would just be part of a, a broader law. And I, I should just note also, and Irene also touched on this, you know, a new supply chains law, which is what we recommend, isn't a silver bullet. We do need other mechanisms in place, you know, and, and sort of push all those levers to help um, uh, to help provide decent work for all workers, not just prevent abuse. So we de do need more resourcing of labor inspectorates. Um, there's trade unions calling for joint uh, liability, for example. So that would allow workers and supply chains to take up grievances and seek remedy all the way up the supply chain. Um, and this would really help to reduce the sort of outsourcing of responsibility that we're seeing through subcontracting and would help level the playing field for all um, entities within a supply chain. So there's a lot of different measures and ideas that are out there um, that could help um, address a lot of the labor uh, abuse and exploitation that is happening. But I think a focus on um, modern slavery and on reporting alone to address modern slavery is just, it's never going to be um, an adequate and effective way to, to address that abuse. So I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Patricia, thank you very much indeed. Lots of, um, lots of food for thought there. We'll come back to in the questions. Can I now move to Owen, please? Thank you, and uh, thank you very much for having me on the panel today. It's uh, really great to see this report, and we certainly really welcome this kind of research to really tangibly evidence the effectiveness uh, of uh, modern slavery measures. Um, so I think much of what I am going to say about the success or otherwise of Section 54 is going to echo both the report and what Patricia has said. Um, initially, when it was introduced, it had a goal of encouraging a race to the top, and of levelling the playing fields so that responsible businesses could be rewarded for their efforts and less scrupulous businesses could be held to account for what they were not doing. Overall, uh, I don't think we've seen either of those things fully happen in practice. What we have maybe seen, and I think what has been alluded to already, is a much more limited a race at the top, if you like, a small number of businesses, particularly in sectors that are highly scrutinised, who have done good work and have produced robust statements, but they are very much a minority. And also those leading companies, many of whom ETI works with, uh, are now beginning to question, I think, the value of putting so much time and resource into their modern slavery reporting, when they may see competitors get away with saying very little or nothing at all. And those businesses that do make an effort to be open and transparent may in the end uh, get more criticism rather than less. But at the same time, uh, I think Section 54 has had some key achievements, uh, and it's useful to think about those as the report does in terms of different kinds of impact and effectiveness. So I think it has raised awareness across sectors. Despite the low compliance rates, there are certainly sectors where for some businesses, having to write a statement may have been the first engagement of any sort that they had with modern slavery. And that's been really important. The Section 54 obligation has also raised the profile of modern slavery within businesses by requiring director and board level engagement with the statement sign off. And in some cases, that's elevated it from what may previously have been uh, a more niche concern belonging to an ethical trade team or a corporate social responsibility team. And then third, Section 54, by providing the reporting obligation, created 
a tool that civil society and increasingly investors have been able to use to interrogate corporate action on modern slavery. I completely agree that the burden of enforcement shouldn't rest solely on civil society, but I think it's important to recognize what has been done and the use that modern slavery statements have been put to. So certainly section 54 can and should be strengthened in several ways. Uh, mandatory reporting content will be an enormous help to enable uh, consistency and comparison between statements to ensure meaningful disclosure or more meaningful disclosure uh, and uh, easier monitoring of statements that have been published. And of course, the registry is also a very important part of that. Uh, another point about improving Section 54, of course, is the extension of the obligation to the public sector, which is crucial given the spending power of government and its ability to influence labor standards in its supply chains. In terms of where we might move forwards more broadly, uh, I'll make two quick points. First, I think uh, nearly six years on now from the Modern Slavery Act, many businesses are still uncomfortable talking publicly about what they don't know and the risks in their supply chains that they are unsure how to address. We do still need to find ways to incentivize the open discussion by business of the uncertainties that they face. Modern slavery reporting has helped, but it certainly has not answered that question. It's difficult to do this. It's difficult for businesses to talk about these things publicly. But unless there is a, an environment in which they can do so, uh, then the information which needs to be shared isn't. And that's what allows collaboration across sectors, which is a point that the BHRRC report makes. Sectors might share business models, supply chain structures, sourcing locations, even individual suppliers. And collaboratively, they can do far more than any individual business can. Then second, uh, and again to echo Patricia, is the importance of taking a holistic structural approach to addressing modern slavery and not trying to treat it as an isolated phenomenon. ETI has always approached advising businesses on their modern slavery reporting by encouraging them to treat it as due diligence reporting and to focus on the tangible due diligence activities which should underlie it. So it is vital that we look at labor exploitation as a spectrum with modern slavery just one end of that spectrum. And it's equally important that we recognize and address the structural vulnerabilities like gender, migration status, employment status that can make individuals vulnerable to moving into a situation of modern slavery, to moving them along that spectrum. Uh, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Owen. Um, move straight over to Stuart, please. Thank you, Mary. Uh, delighted to be to be on the panel, and, and I'll certainly echo some some of the points already made by Owen and Patricia, but not not in detail. I'm also delighted that Lisa used my favourite phrase, which is an outcomes based approach, uh, which I, which I was planning to, to talk about. Um, uh, and really, why I want to talk about the outcomes based approach is to acknowledge the fundamental policy difference behind the regulations and the laws rather that Irene was talking about, such as the Bribery Act and the Modern Slavery Act Section 54 reporting requirement. I think unless you acknowledge the difference in, in policy, it's, it's you know, the, the, the difference in law is difficult to, re to reconcile. Um, the, the idea, and it's explicit in the Modern Slavery Act guidance, uh, is, is incentivizing good corporate behavior um, to encourage the race to the top, as, as Owen was, was talking about. Um, Different to that is the Bribery Act guidance, uh, which makes clear that the, the government's objective behind the Bribery Act is to, to act as a deterrent. Um, and the key mechanism by which the Bribery Act is a deterrent is heavy fines, which in some cases for a business could be an existential threat. Clearly, the, the Modern Slavery Act has nothing of the sort. Um, that means that the Modern Slavery Act does not impose the same sorts of resourcing demands on businesses um, as the Bribery Act does, which naturally means that in responding to the Modern Slavery Act, um, businesses have perhaps not allocated enough resource in terms of budget and personnel to comply with the transparency requirement and actually conducting the Modern Slavery due diligence that, that is expected um, under the Act. So if you're to look at Bribery Act compliance um, and what makes for an effective anti-bribery program, which might offer you the defense to the corporate defense of failing to prevent bribery. Um, the key component, and this is the outcomes-based approach I was talking about, is 
the ability to identify your key bribery risks and then monitor the effectiveness of the steps that you take to manage those bribery risks. And it's, it's evident that in the benchmarking reports that have been published over the years, uh, comparing the non-slavery statements that have been published by businesses, two key weaknesses that come up time and again are, are those key points. So identifying risks and disclosing the key non-slavery risks that the business faces, and also then monitoring uh, the effectiveness of the non-slavery program in managing those risks. So two of the key benchmarks, or sorry, two of the key indicators that would be indicative of an effective bribery program seem to be missing when it comes to businesses reporting about their modern slavery programs. Um, but where there is monitoring, uh, it can be quite effective. So I think a little bit of an unsung hero in, in this area is the NHS Labour Standards Assurance System, where uh, the, the NHS requires its suppliers to go through a four-tier maturity framework, where if you're to supply um, goods or services to the NHS, you have to commit to going through the four steps of improving your labour standards um, in your supply chain. And I think that's been quite effective. Uh, and I think that can show how, how monitoring um, can play a role in improving standards over time in the way that the Month's Labour Act envisaged. Um, beyond that sort of public sector monitoring, um, where entities like the NHS act as a sort of quasi-regulator, you do have businesses, uh, private companies, that are conducting audits of entities in their supply chains. And I think this is where Owen talks about the race to the top, where issues are identified in suppliers in terms of whether it's migrant labor welfare issues or, or, or anything like that, where the business um, as the customer then agrees a corrective action plan with the supplier to take things forward in sort of an equator principles style approach. Um, that, is not something I think which is done across the board and is probably reflective of, as I say, those businesses at the top. Um, but what has been pleasing to see, um, and Owen's already mentioned this, is investors, including particularly pension funds, proactively carrying out their own due diligence. So actually you're in a scenario now where the investors and companies actually know more about their supply chains than the companies do themselves. Um, so I think that's a flavor of, of, of some of the monitoring that's going on. What does it mean for the businesses who are not involved or engaged in that race to the top? So these are the businesses that um, perhaps, but for the Mun Slavery Act, would not be aware of business and human rights and have never heard the, heard of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, for example. I think there is something to be said for the fact that the Mun Slavery Act has ensured that modern slavery has surfaced as a boardroom issue. And when directors come to approve and sign public disclosures, such as the modern slavery statements that, they, that the companies have to publish annually. Directors are mindful of their duties to act, their, their duty under section 174 of the Companies Act to um, conduct, them, conduct their, their, their business with a reasonable care, skill and diligence um, as, as part of the director's duties. So that has been an important aspect of the modern slavery act, just raising this issue to the top of companies. Um, in terms of potential areas for reform, um, I think it's interesting, one component of, um, or, or one outcome rather of Brexit is that the UK now has an independent customs regime, just in the same way that it has an independent sanctions regime. In the United States, the, the US government has shown an increased propensity to use its, um, use its uh, tariffs act to stop goods entering the United States where there is a suspicion that those goods have been produced using slave labor. and and clearly because the UK now has its own independent customs regime, it may well want to go down a similar path. Um, there, there may be an opportunity to um, amend the Modern Slavery Act to in involve more of a personal responsibility for certain individuals with, within the company, uh, not necessarily delving into the topic of director's duties, but rather looking at, for example, the Dutch child labor due diligence law which requires companies, or which will when it comes into to force in 2022, uh, will require companies to designate a senior individual as a compliance officer. Um, and, and that person would be responsible for ensuring compliance with, with the law. That could be an interesting way forward as well. And, and then just as a final uh, concluding remark, there is a question to be raised regarding whether or not the Modern Slavery Act uh, has a limited shelf life, uh, bearing in mind the emergence of mandatory human rights due diligence laws. And it seems almost in near certainty now that the EU will adopt a mandatory 
human rights due diligence law. And it would appear that that law will have an extraterritorial component where non-EU businesses selling goods or services into the single market will have to comply. And recognizing that the UK is the EU's biggest, sorry, the, the EU is the UK's rather biggest single trading partner, uh, UK businesses will, will no doubt have to respond to that law. And in that context, does the Modern Slavery Act um, appear a little bit lightweight? Um, so I'll just leave that as a, as a trading thought and conclude there. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, Stuart. Uh, Steve, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, I'd just like to say a few things. I, I, I'm one of the authors of the report, so um, I'll commend the report to, to everybody to uh, uh, hear what we've got to say in more detail. But I, I'm, here I'll just pick out three observations we, which I've come to um, as we've uh, come to the end of this work. Um, and the first one is that context matters when we're reading these reports. When, when we look at these company statements, um, one, uh, one trap we could fall into is to um, uh, delude ourselves that we could uh, can read these and, and really understand what, what on earth we're seeing without understanding a bit more about the companies involved. Uh, for example, just even finding what we mean by supply chain is, is a tricky kind of issue. And companies have an enormous amount of latitude for defining what they mean by that. And uh, as we've shown in the report, um, companies even get to choose exactly what companies, uh, what parts of their activities they're drawing under the orbit of these statements or not. And um, uh, I think what we've understood is that making sense of both what the document says and what we, what we imagine the document might do also depends on the context. So, for example, the idea of a well-known company, public-facing company, uh, having a report and the public in general or civil society is likely to sort of crawl all over it and, uh, and think about it is one thing. But of course, many companies and a great chunk of the economy are fairly anonymous companies we don't know about uh, and who don't have any interest from NGOs and so forth. Or indeed, as in the case of Babcock, the company we looked at, um, one of the companies we looked at in the report is a company that if anyone was going to crawl over Babcock, there'd be much more likely any activist type activity, NGO activity, be much more likely to go at the fact that it's involved with making nuclear weapons rather than uh, its um, modern slavery uh, practices in its supply chain. So I think context matters and one trap we could fall into is assuming that this instrument is going to apply equally across all different sorts of companies. Uh, the other thing I think is clear is that we can't take what the companies say at face value. In other words, we don't have, we, you know, we shouldn't delude ourselves that when firms say things that they are true. Now, this might not mean that they are barefaced lies, but it might mean that they are aspirations or approximations or glosses on things that go on. And uh, I think we have to be deeply cynical about what we read and understand that things, things need to be um, uh, tested, which means that even if firms were to completely comply with the law as set and to really spell out, you know, uh, uh, tick all the boxes in terms of the guidelines of what the things they're supposed to say, that doesn't necessarily mean that the things, <laughs> that what they're saying is true. Um, and that is something we need to bear in mind. For the accountability to work, we have to have a mechanism whereby the readers of the report, be they investors or employees or NGOs or academics or journalists, have some uh, point of contact uh, where there's some type of purchase on these systems where they can be interrogated and challenged. And I think that's um, uh, important. So the type of transparency perhaps we ought to think about uh, moving forward is not so much a transparency about aspirations, but about operations, about the detail of what organizations actually do. And perhaps um, uh, we need to think about what are the crucial data points that we need firms to report, which would enable uh, society at large to have a better sense of regulation of um, the companies on which our entire uh, lives, uh, lives and uh, economy are based. Thank you.
Steve, thank you very much indeed. And thank you to all our expert panelists. Um, so we, we are now going to move to um, some questions and answers. Um, I'd just like to encourage, we've got some uh, questions in the Q&A box. If I could encourage members of the audience to continue to provide some questions in there, that would be extremely helpful. I'd just like to get the ball rolling, if I may, by asking one or two questions of our panelists about some of the specific aspects in the government's proposals for moving beyond section 54. Um, so I'm interested in particular in our experts' views on the financial penalties proposal that was announced by the Foreign Secretary in January. Um, uh, obviously brought forward as an announcement probably um, in the context of the, um, the, the, the particular need to respond in relation to what's going on in China. Um, but I'm interested in the panelists' views on whether the financial penalties proposal um, goes far enough um, and, and whether um, this is, is, is a good step forward. Um, what, what do our panelists think? Perhaps I could go in the order in which we heard from people if they want to speak and please pass over the question if you wanted to pass it to the next panelist. Okay, I can start. Um, I think financial penalties could be a great way to increase compliance. Um, I'm not sure how you know, the percentage of companies that currently are not reporting, but as has been pointed out, a lot of these companies are not consumer facing. They're not well known among the public, so they can fly under the radar quite easily um, by not reporting. So I do think uh, financial penalties would be very beneficial in getting um, compliance rates up. I think you know, something Stuart said was that, you know, penalties under the Bribery Act can be an existential threat. So as far as I remember from the government's um, response to the consultation where it said it would look further into penalties, but it also sort of kicked it further down the line to the um, to be developed single enforcement body. Um, they weren't sure what that would look like, what kinds of penalties, how much those would be. I think the answers from various stakeholders through the consultation varied as to what that would look like, how much, how much a penalty should be. I think it needs to be quite large to have any sort of impact. Um, otherwise businesses can just you know, um, absorb it as part of a, a cost of doing business. So it, it needs to be quite considerable. As far as when that proposal might happen, you know, at, at the time when the um, amendments to the MSA were announced, to the TISC provision rather, um, it was said it would happen when parliamentary time allows. And I don't think we've heard any further news about when that might happen. I was a bit surprised therefore when um, the Secretary of State announced again that they would consider or would impose financial penalties as this was you know, a, a sort of unknown timeline previously when they mentioned it. So I do think it would help. Um, but not sure how much of an impact it would have again on in terms of um, companies actually taking the necessary steps to actually identify their risks and address them properly. I'll pass it on to Owen. Thank you. Um, I'll maybe just make two observations on, on the penalties. I think it is clear that we do need some sort of additional incentive to ensure that companies that are not currently complying at all with the legislation do so. Clearly that's been a significant issue and financial penalties may be one way of achieving that. But I think we do need to be careful in how we implement any penalties to ensure that we're incentivizing the right behavior. And what we want to incentivize are meaningful modern slavery reports that uh, disclose meaningful action. Um, we don't want to incentivize tick box compliance that just tries to meet minimum criteria to avoid having a fine imposed. Uh, and then I think the second thing is just that, obviously, to have a meaningful um, penalty mechanism, we need to have really robust monitoring and enforcement in place, uh, which would be a challenging thing, uh, as Lisa alluded to in her presentation, um, and would need some kind of institutional infrastructure to apply in practice, whether that's the single enforcement body or something else. Uh, it's not that that couldn't be done, but I don't think we have a clear answer yet to, to what that would look like in practice. Yeah, just picking up on, on that, um, the, the penalties would be imposed potentially, I guess, at least in the current formulation of the Bond Slavery Act, for potentially two things. One would be 
technical compliance with the Act, uh, and the second would be veracity of the contents of the statement. Um, that raises the question of, of who would do that. I think, Owen, this is, this is your point, um, and also what's in the public interest. So in terms of technical compliance with the Act, um, I think you would perhaps looking, you'd be looking for the most egregious um, entities where they're obviously not complying rather than um, expecting a regulator to delve into great detail about which potential entity has not reported in the context of a group that is reporting and is publishing a group-wide statement anyway type of thing. Um, in terms of monitoring and, and scrutinizing the veracity of the statement and, and the truth of, of what's actually being reported, um, I think there's interesting precedent. You can look at the Financial Reporting Council, which obviously scrutinizes what um, businesses uh, put out in their, in their annual reports. Um, that's quite a laborious process. Um, and uh, that if, if, if an entity like, say, the Financial Reporting Council were to take that on, um, they would need to have a significant resource in order to do it and ultimately engage with businesses to test whether or not, say, they are due diligence their supply chain to the extent that they say they are. Um, and, and query whether or not that might encourage businesses concerned about that regulator's activity to say less rather than more. Um, that's just a, a, a thought. Uh, yeah, and uh, I would uh, echo exactly th that thought. Um, I mean, there are basically three things you could fine a company for. One is, uh, one, you know, two come under the current act. Do they publish something? Um, is it true? Uh, and then a further thing is, you know, do you punish companies who are discovered to have exploitation in their supply chain? Um, you know, if, uh, if something um, crops up and they clearly know something about what's happened. And all of those things require, uh, apart from the first one, just whether they've got a statement or not, I think you could find companies for that. Um, but uh, as currently phrased, um, it's trivial to do it. I mean, the point about publishing a modern slavery statement that meets the act is it is cost free. And the only reason people are not doing it is because they're not you know, paying attention, but, but they could easily at a drop of a hat produce one that would meet the terms of the act, um, but mean, mean nothing. Um, so it all hinges on the question of uh, the machinery that's in place to deal with, to en engage with the company and investigate. And as uh, Stuart pointed out with the um, uh, financial reporting requirements, that's complicated. That requires you know, experts who've got access to information. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, in order for fines to change companies' behavior, they have to be enormous fines. And the situation we have, for example, in financial services in this country is that uh, financial services companies, banks and so forth, now take fines for misbehavior as a cost of doing business. You know, they kind of have a budget for it in, in their annual uh, planning cycle. And uh, it doesn't, you know, the, the fining regime does not have, isn't an effect of its changing behavior. So if we're going to have fines, and they're going to have to do something. It's going to be very substantial or it's got to be personal sanctions on the leaders of the organizations. Thanks very much, all of you. And um, Steve, thank you. You've, you've actually answered there a question from Andrew Wallace in the Q&A about whether uh, financial penalties will just be, be factored in by businesses as a, as a cost of doing business. Um, so your answer to that is uh, they have to be big in order to avoid that. Yeah. OK, excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, can I shift to Another aspect of what's being proposed by the government in its changes to Section 54, which is the extension to public authorities. Um, I'm interested in our panellists' views on whether they think that will be effective. Um, do you think that extending the Section 54 disclosure duty to public authorities will have a dramatic impact in terms of leveraging public procurement cultures in public authorities. Uh, do you think it's going to make much of a difference to the way the government does its own business? What, what are the views on, on, on that proposal? Well, 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 I'm happy to kick off with an initial comment, which is uh, it takes us back to the definition of supply chain um, uh, and exactly what you mean. Uh, if you look at public procurement as it happens, uh, a great deal of it is extremely complicated because it involves uh, not a supplier, a single company, but a, a very complicated network of companies and many layers of outsourcing. And so you would have to, uh, to make this really effective, 
you do have, probably have to have um, a greater degree of specificity about what is defined by the supply chain. Um, otherwise, you can have the first tier, as it were, complying, but actually they're not the people who are doing any of the work. They're, it's their uh, suppliers or their suppliers and so forth. I think from, from my perspective, I think it's certainly positive. I mentioned the NHS Labour Standards Assurance System, and uh, I think that could easily be something which Crown Commercial Services adopted across the board. Um, and if the, um, with the extension of the Bonds Labour Act to public entities, clearly that will be something which ultimately, when the government entities then reflect on what it is they could be doing, that NHS type model, I think, would be something which would then potentially be replicated in other government departments. And, and, and so that could have a, a, a really positive impact. Um, I think that uh, if you look at the current consultation at the moment about potential reforms in the area of debarment, uh, when entities uh, would not be allowed to bid for government work because of potential impropriety on their part, uh, at the moment, mon slavery is not factored in save in so far as an entity may have been convicted of mon slavery which is a criminal offense now of course we all know that very few businesses get convicted of mon slavery so it may be that um, a company's approach to its mon slavery program would be a factor taken into account by the government in, as part of the procurement process in connection with its own reporting under the um, mon slavery act and, and therefore acting as that um, regulator using its procurement function. Go ahead, Patricia. <laughs> um, yeah, just to echo a couple of things that Stuart has said, we have advocated for the public sector to be covered by Section 54 as well. Um, and to your point, Stuart, about a company being convicted of mo a modern slavery offense. It's a very high threshold. And even in that situation, I believe they are only barred for three years or five years from the time of conviction. So it's, it's not even a permanent exclusion. So um, yeah, I mean, we would, we would push for going even further and saying perhaps companies that show they are undertaking proper due diligence to take into account labor standards and labor rights should be prioritized for public contracts, for example. Um, again, when we talk about modern slavery, there is so much other abuse on that spectrum that Owen explained very clearly earlier that is prevalent in government contracts. We see it all the time, especially where there is a lot of outsourcing or a lot of services that are being outsourced by the government, such as cleaning, catering, security guards. We've seen a lot of horrible conditions um, occurring during the pandemic. So those are also you know, low wages, um, health and safety concerns, no sick pay, that sort of thing. Those are also labor abuses that need to be really remedied when the government is putting out um, contracts for tender. And, and those are, you know, it's similar issues that we're, we see with companies, obviously. But um, again, a lot of that abuse will, will never amount to modern slavery. So those suppliers won't necessarily be excluded from contracts or even um, sort of deprioritized in tendering. So we do have to look at that broader um, labor rights uh, scenario, uh, but definitely very positive that government will now be held to its own um, standards. Yeah, I mean, I completely echo that. ETI would be very supportive of the extension to the public sector. Um, I don't think we're under any illusions that just um, requiring public sector bodies to produce modern slavery reports uh, will, will suddenly introduce a really dramatic change. But I think as part of uh, bigger changes to systems and processes uh, and culture as well can play a really important part. And Steve mentioned how complex public procurement can be. So I think there are lots of moving parts to be taken account of. But I think we've, we've seen some very encouraging signs. The first um, UK government modern slavery statement was uh, a really significant and symbolic first step. Uh, and more technical measures like the, um, the modern slavery supplier assessment tool that certain companies have to uh, to use if they bid for procurement contracts are also a positive sign, I think, and starting to build conversations within government. Um, one of the commitments, I think, in the government's modern slavery statement was to have individuals in government departments who had a sort of champion role. So measures like that, I think, will, will uh, kind of incrementally build momentum over time, and we'll start seeing that hopefully lead to some, some really significant change. <laughs> 
Thank you all very much indeed. Last question from me. We've now got quite a lot of questions in uh, from the audience, so we're going to turn to those very shortly. Just one more question from me. We're beginning to see quite a lot of divergence between at state level between uh, different approaches to addressing risk of forced labour in supply chains. Um, Stuart has mentioned mandatory human rights due diligence emerging at EU level, um, also in certain national jurisdictions. We're increasingly seeing just recently a turn to import bans, forced labour import bans. I'm interested in the panel's views on the implications of this divergence for effectiveness. How important is it um, that there's a common approach globally to the problem in order to be effective? I'm happy to, to go first. Um, I, I think critical is, is, is the answer um, because companies do spend a relative, um, you know, relatively significant amount of time preparing uh, reports to comply with the, the various laws. And just to pick a, a brief um, sort of example, I, I like the idea of the common reporting period, which is proposed in terms of amending the Mon Slavery Act so that all entities would cover the single reporting period. The slight complexity that raises is that um, a company which is either reporting with a combined statement to cover the California Act and the UK Act or the UK Act and the Australian Act, um, or all three, um, will no longer be able to publish those at the same time, um, which, which adds a slight complexity, just highlighting how when, when companies are actually publishing these statements, um, discrepancies and requirements can create sort of small, um, uh, small issues and challenges. So the, the, the more that um, there is a common framework, um, and and it, looking at the, the developments in, in, in the continent, which we've spoken about already, um, that is increasingly aligned to the UN Guiding Principles approach, uh, which requires business, businesses uh, to not particularly focus on one issues, uh, one issue or topic that is covered by a specific law, but rather to focus on their most severe or salient human rights risks, I think is positive. I, I don't think I have a uh, an answer to your question, Murray, really, uh, but, I, but I, I do have an interesting observation, which is that in our work for this, looking not just at the um, companies who we talk about in the report, but uh, other companies, it's quite easy to find firms who, pu who publish separate statements for the California Act and for the UK Act, for example, and find they say quite different things, which must tell us something about the overall process, though, so um, that uh, they're, they're not just incommensurate because they're saying, you know, working off different crib sheets, but uh, but actually say different things about the organization. And the, the fact that we can find companies doing that suggests that there's something going on in the way that uh, you're within the companies in the how, how they're responding to these uh, issues. I would just add that, um, and I'm basing this on research done by some of the authors of this report, um, which who have found that companies really uh, desire harmonization. So, you know, you have companies that are reporting under California under the French law, they will be reporting under the Dutch law, they will be captured by the EU law. Um, and, you know, where you have different expectations and requirements, it just becomes a big headache. I'm assuming Stuart would know more about this than I do. Um, but anecdotally, that is what we hear. And we have spoken to very large global companies in the US and here in the UK that really are even in favor of moving beyond a transparency law here and aligning more with a human rights due diligence law that is being proposed at the EU level simply because it would be more aligned with what will be required of them elsewhere. So I think the, the harmonization argument is quite strong as well as um, ensuring a level playing field as well. Um, also legal certainty and, and those types of things get thrown around, around as well. Um, but again, I would, I would just point to the research done by some of the other authors um, that have done reports on this previously. Maybe just quickly to add, as has been mentioned, we do have the global standard of the UN guiding principles. Um, and often I think it's a question of them being interpreted and implemented in slightly different ways in different places. But ultimately there is wide agreement that, that they are the standard. And I think it's important that we work to ensure um, that that standard is applied as uh, consistently and harmoniously as possible. Excellent, thank you all very much for those answers. I'm now gonna to move to the um, 
questions we've been asked in, in the Q&A, um, I've, I've been trying to group them thematically. It's actually rather challenging. So I'm going to pick out some that are clearly directed at particular uh, members of the panel um, to start with. Um, so I think I, I'd like to ask um, Stuart, first of all, a message um, from Shirley Goodrick. While some companies are being transparent in reporting, to the extent of sharing case studies of incidents they've experienced, what is the risk that under new human rights due diligence laws, they could open themselves to prosecution based on what they've declared in their modern slavery statement? Stuart, did you want to address that? Well, at present, there are companies who um, have put themselves, you could argue, in a position where they are already at um, risk. Um, I, it, with prosecution always comes the question um, on the part of the prosecutor, so, certainly under English criminal law, which is if you apply the code of crown prosecutors, uh, you don't um, commence uh, um, criminal litigation if you are the prosecutor, unless um, there's a reasonable ground to suspect you've got the evidence. And secondly, that is in the public interest. Um, so I think a certain amount of prosecutor restraint is, is called for where you have companies currently um, I won't reference names, but who are reporting under, say, the UN Guiding Principles reporting framework and include statements along the lines of the more due diligence we do, the more convinced we are we have child labour in our supply chain um, now and, and other modern slavery issues. Now, in theory, at least, that raises a whole host of criminal liability issues, including um, proceeds of crime and money laundering issues. Uh, but I don't necessarily see any prosecutors looking to punish companies who, who, who are publishing to that degree um, because of their, their candor. Um, certainly there's, there's an issue um, around um, what companies put in their statements and liability arising from that. We have already seen that um, potentially manifest or, or manifest in, in the civil liability context in the claims um, in the English courts around say parent company liability and the extent to which parent companies have assumed responsibility, a duty of care towards um, claimants allegedly harmed by the act of um, subsidiaries because those parent companies have implemented group-wide statements where they purport to have group-wide sustainability programs. Um, so that risk is, is there. Um, the benefit um, of uh, mandatory reporting uh, is that it moves you away from the free rider risk where companies are better off by saying less. Um, and, and although I think I agree with your premise that I guess there's a risk of companies disclosing um, uh, potential criminality in their statements, I guess it's unlikely that um, companies would disclose a level of um, information. Uh, I, I think I, I certainly haven't seen beyond the, the example I've given of, of companies um, disclosing clear acts of, of potential involvement and criminal liability. Um, but uh, it's, it's just, generally the information is at an aggregated level such that um, it doesn't disclose specific case studies of, of, of uh, which indicate criminal liability. Uh, but to the extent they do, I guess I would go back to the prosecutorial discretion point. Um, is, is it in the public interest? And it may well be in the public interest. Um, you know, it might be a disclosure of a particularly egregious example, which does warrant a prosecutor to look at it. Thanks, Stuart. And we've got a, a, a related question from Kira Barry. Um, how do we overcome brands' nervousness to disclose beyond what they're legally obliged to? How do we change this climate of fear? Uh, companies who do good work, including discovering and remediating cases, hold back disclosing. And when they do disclose, can be criticised for having instances of modern slavery, um, even media headlines damaging their brand reputation. Does any member of the panel want to ask about how to address that? I think my immediate answer to that, sorry, Patricia, you, I've seen you come with me. Uh, well, just from this sort of civil society angle, um, you know, the intention of Section 54 was to disclose exactly these types of types of cases and, and information. So I just think it's uh, the responsibility of, of us organizations who are looking at these things and looking at these statements and scrutinizing companies. Um, as well as media, et cetera, to really look at, you know, if we keep banging on about how modern slavery is so endemic in supply chains, we cannot then uh, have these headlines when a company is open about it or when it is discovered. I think the important thing to focus on is then what is being done to remediate and to prevent that from recurring. 
Um, I think Tesco did a pretty good job the, earlier this year, last year, when they reported on some things they had identified in their supply chain, such as recruitment fees and passport retention, um, but they had a very clear uh, plan for how to address that. Now, again, I'm not, there's always going to be gaps between plans and policies and, and what is said in a statement or to a journalist and, and what might be happening on the ground. But I think where we wanna to move towards is encouraging companies to put in as strong a due diligence program as possible in order to prevent that as much as, as possible. But you know these, these things are going to occur. And so we just need to focus on what, what the company has planned to address that rather than the, the incident itself, unless this is you know a long history of abuse that just simply has been papered over or hasn't been properly addressed. Um, we have the case of Boohoo last summer that you know such egregious abuses were discovered. This had been in the media for a very long time. Um, there was finally an independent investigation, et cetera, but they had been saying for a long time they were going to address the issues in their factories in Leicester and they hadn't. So um, again, there just needs to be constant monitoring um, and tracking and just making sure that companies are, um, when they have identified something, doing what is necessary to, to address that. Just an additional point I was going to make around um, the issue of criminal liability um, and the risks that, that businesses face in this area is um, absent certain strict liability offenses, uh, you need to, uh, in order to bring a successful prosecution against a company in criminal law, um, at least under English law, you have to you have to get over the identification principle, which is um, attributing um, knowledge to people who are very senior within the company. So senior management at the, the board level. Um, it's unlikely that the companies who are taking the most proactive modern slavery steps or human rights steps will be the sorts of companies where people in that category have knowing um, are, are knowingly involved in modern slavery and human rights. If you look at say the DJ Houghton case um, last year where directors were found liable um, for modern slavery perpetuated by the company, they had a very clear knowing involvement in the, the perpetuation of that slavery. Um, so actually rather the, the, the companies who are at risk of being prosecuted are those which are likely to be saying nothing at all. If I can just add to that, I think this is a case where context, uh, the context point comes out because I think it's uh, in our heads it's quite easy to think about this question and, and actually the, the companies that spring to mind are mega corporations like Tesco or Nestle or, or somebody, um, but actually where um, you know, it, it's got other sorts of companies, the Horton of the things, where, um, uh, where we may, might have the most problems and where we might be perhaps more sensible to focus some of our um, uh, attention on these matters. So just a, a final quick comment then. I think um, often where we do see very rare examples of companies talking about specific incidents in their supply chains, there are examples along the lines that Patricia mentions where the company can say, we identified this incident, we then took the following action and this was the outcome. Um, so they, they are able to report something positive about what they did. I think the key thing to enable that and to slightly self-interested answer is to have spaces where businesses can talk to one another as well as to civil society and to trade unions like multi-stakeholder initiatives um, where they can figure out what the right action is to take so that they can then report on it. Um, I mean, just another quick point is there is a lot that businesses can be uncomfortable with reporting publicly, which is not to do with criminal liability necessarily, and is more broadly about reputational risk, I think. And that's things like um, uncertainty or lack of visibility when it comes to areas of their supply chain, quite broad areas where they may just, they not, may not have fully mapped their supply chain, they may know there are risks, but not know the detail of those risks. I think they're unlikely to be questions of liability and more about what a company feels comfortable owning up to not knowing. And that's more about, I think, a kind of climate and a culture which we can definitely work to address. Thank you all very much. Um, a related question, you may feel you've answered this in your answers already, but, but if not, then, then please do come back. Um, another question 
pointing out the the risk of discouraging rather than encouraging businesses and the um, often expressed view um, that businesses who um, are actually doing things to identify modern slavery in their supply chain and then very reluctant to um, allow that to become public uh, because of the reputational risk and the um, sort of immediate condemnation um, even though they're taking proactive steps to do so uh, so the question broadly is is enforcement in in these cases really the the way to go how do we get the balance right between um, encouragement and discouragement Does the panel feel they've, they've answered that in their previous answers? Apologies, I think my internet just dropped, but I'm back. Sorry, Steve, you go. No, okay, I was just going to say, it, it, again, this I think is a, is a context type question because there's a category of companies for whom telling a story about their supply chains it, 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 you know, maps very closely along to, uh, to other uh, expressions of corporate virtue and PR and so forth, and for whom that's uh, uh, the dynamics of this whole reporting and transparency works in one way, and another set of companies for whom the, the operations of transparency work in quite a different way. So I think one of the, the issues is to segment the way we think about these things and imagine different mechanisms of improvement and change and reputation and so forth operating uh, quite differently for different sorts of companies. I, I think it's important to recognize that um, in the context of um, larger companies, uh, particularly listed entities, um, the ship has sailed uh, to the point where um, you are concerned about your ESG index scores. Uh, you are also concerned about um, the fact you now have to publish, if you're a large UK corporate, you need to publish the section 172 statement, which, show, which, which states how the directors have had regard to, to their duties to um, act in the best interests of, of the company for the benefit of its members, but taking into account um, issues including human rights. Um, and therefore, actually, it's, it's not palatable for companies in that category uh, to do nothing anymore. And the idea is that companies in that category are the ones that engage the smaller companies and those companies, you know, go all the way down working with the SMEs and so that everyone is part of everyone else's supply chain. And um, clearly, what we've seen is that there are gaps that's not quite how it works but I think um, there is a little bit of a false distinction here and so far as uh, most companies um, certainly with external investors who scrutinize um, what they are doing and for example their, their disclosures and their annual reports once section 172 statement included um, they are no longer able to to take a slightly reactive approach to this Okay, change of subject. Um, interested in the panel's views on compliance of the Modern Slavery Act in the UK finance sector, pointing out that very few studies have examined compliance with the Act um, in the finance sector. Um, important to note, although the traditionally financial services sector has considered itself a low risk, research carried out by the Australian Council of Superannuation Investors and the Liechtenstein Initiative suggest the finance sector is characterized by high exposure to modern slavery. Um, what are the panel's thoughts on that? Uh, I think I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks, uh, we at the Resource Center have collaborated with um, Walk Free and WikiRate to assess the modern slavery statements of 91 asset managers that we had identified as likely have, uh, being required to report under the Modern Slavery Act. That report will come out next week. Um, but we were very much interested in looking at the financial sector more broadly and then through some external consultation landed on asset managers specifically because of the leverage that they hold um, within um, investment relationships. And so I won't give away too much of the findings, but not surprisingly, the reporting um, among those asset managers wasn't, wasn't very good. It wasn't great. Um, and not just looking at the due diligence and practices related to operations and supply chains. We also looked at whether and how much they were doing um, with regard to their investment portfolios. So any due diligence related to the companies that they invest in. Um, and this is, you know, although not strictly required under the act, this is something that is increasingly um, 
well, it is required under the UNGPs, the OECD guidelines also um, recommend this, the, P the PRI with whom we are coasting a, a round table for the launch of this report are also increasingly, um, they're ex increasing their own expectations on their signatories to do this type of due diligence um, on human rights and labor rights, et cetera. So I think, you know, there is so much development happening in the finance sector with regard to modern slavery, but also looking at human rights and labor rights more broadly under the S of ESG. Um, and I do, I f you can feel that it's something that's going to continue to be pushed um, among various stakeholders uh, because they do have such an enormous amount of leverage, much more than consumers, much more than you know, NGOs and those of us working in this space and probably more than governments <laughs> unless you, you know, impose much stricter laws on companies. So I, I, I do think that um, the finance sector is sort of the next target, uh, at least for some of us looking at what they're doing. Um, but also, yeah, to, to simply say we are a low risk sector, which many of the statements did say, is simply, you know, you're not taking into account so many of the services that you use on a daily basis. Again, cleaning, catering, that sort of thing that are uh, high risk for labor abuse, but also, um, you know, start looking at the, the sort of technology you're using and, and that sort of thing. So, and I'm, I will say that is separate from the risks that banks face um, with regard to money laundering and through tr from trafficking and that sort of thing. So we're not looking at, at those sorts of issues, but um, much more at the, um, yeah, yeah, as I said, asset managers and then their, their relationships with their investee companies. happy to perhaps add a reflection from the bank's perspective if that's if that's useful um it it, it varies but s some of the global banks are are making great strides um to address uh, human rights in their various um divisions so whether it's uh, just general corporate lending or securities underwriting uh, reflecting on the the oecd responsible business uh, conduct guidelines for um corporate lending and securities underwriting, which the banks played a part in in the, the drafting of. Um, there certainly is a move away from just focusing on project finance and the equator principles, which was the traditional um, risk area from, from an ESG perspective for, for, for banks. When it comes to banks' modern slavery statements, um, they are slightly constrained by client confidentiality. So it's quite rare to see um, specific case studies, although it is possible to, to get a client's consent to talk about a case study where a bank has perhaps used its leverage to bring about a positive um, human rights development. Um, but uh, there was initially, I, I think there's certainly now a recognition that the Mun Slavery Act statement requirements extend not just to the bank's own business and its supply chains, but also to its client relationships. And I think there was a little bit of a known goal when the Mun Slavery Act first came out, because the way that Section 54 was drafted, talking about your own business or your supply chains, in theory, it, it kind of seemed to perhaps miss the client relationships. But then happily, the guidance came out a few months later and buried uh, sort of somewhere in the middle of the guidance, there was a reference to transaction risks and money laundering, which Patricia has spoken about, which clarified that actually, yes, in the spirit of um, complying with the, the Mon Slavery Act, banks should be talking about their, their lending and other practices um, in terms of their clients. And, and, and most certainly have gone down that road. Thanks, Stuart. I think Lisa had a, a hand raised. Lisa, did you want to come in? Perhaps it was an accidental hand. It, nope. it was indeed, Murray. Sorry. Okay, Lisa. No, no problem at all. Um, Steve, did, did you want to come in there? No, no, that's fine. I, I think Stuart covered that very well. Okay. Okay, I'd like to go back to um, a more fundamental challenge to the sort of emph emphasis on, in, on on enforcement. So Andrew Wallace has pointed out. In the Q and A, um, that there are already enforcement powers in Section Fifty Four of the Modern Slavery Act as it is, and they just haven't been used. Um, so why haven't they been used? Why, why did the panel think they haven't been used? Um, and why do we think that if there are more enforcement powers taken, they will be used in future? Well, I, th I think one one point would be that um, the uh, having powers is one thing. 
and then having someone to have the power and do it is another thing. So you need infrastructure and institutional arrangements um, to do that. And um, uh, this isn't kind of a thing where the companies report something and then something happens. It, to, to have a kind of enforcement of process which would really work here, you would have to have some kind of engagement, some sort of interaction. And that is expensive and slow. So you do need to have um, some kind of institution to enforce rather than just a, a risk of an abstract risk of enforcement. And then I think the other piece to that is the need for monitoring as well. And that's been a limitation so far, uh, even having certainty on exactly which companies are in scope of the act in some, in some cases has been challenging uh, and having a picture of the overall number. So I think the modern slavery registry is a really key piece uh, of the uh, enforcement aspect. Um, any penalties that are introduced um, will no doubt be a lot easier to enforce. We have a public list uh, of all the companies that have reported and an easy way of uh, understanding whether they've complied or not. So I hope that will certainly um, help uh, shift things in that respect as well. Yeah, I would I would echo what Owen said about um, just having spoken with home office quite a bit about this. Um, it is quite hard to determine year to year which companies are in scope um, and and as they're not as until recently doing very much monitoring. Um, so trying to identify which companies on their private list have or have not reported. I, I don't think they wanted to take the route of doing the injunction mechanism given how costly and consuming and, and who would do it as was pointed out. Um, again, as Owen said, I do think the, the registry that they launch shortly will help a lot with that. I'm not sure if there will be a public list of companies that are required to report or a list that is publicly available. I think it should be. Um, it it's just, you know, obviously a, a benefit for being transparent and ensuring that any company that has not reported can be called to account, not just privately by the government, by, but by other stakeholders. Um, and just to say the government has just taken a very light touch approach thus far. So using letters, um, likely engaging directly with companies uh, they think haven't reported. I will say quickly, the other issue has been these group statements that Stuart mentioned earlier. Um, in earlier years, a group statement would just say, we, the company, published a statement on behalf of all of our subsidiaries. It was very hard, therefore, to determine which exactly those subsidiaries were. Were they in scope? And therefore, could we say they had reported um, companies now due to further guidance by the government um, are being much more explicit about which entities are covered by their statement, making it that much more efficient and accurate when trying to determine who has reported and who has not. And, and that should also help with using enforcement mechanisms. Thanks very much, Patricia. Um, we've got time for one more question very quickly. Um, this is Steve from your colleague, Lucia Zedner. Um, given the doubts raised about the likely efficacy of imposing financial penalties for non-compliance, might incentive structures work better than sticks? So if so, what form might these incentives take? Uh, that's a good question, which I'd um, uh, be very interested to know other people's answers for. Um, I think one of the, uh, I mean, uh, for certain companies, doing a great job on their supply, um, uh, uh, modern slavery statements is, is a commensurate and integrated part of a much broader effort uh, to do with uh, corporate social responsibility or um, increasingly now being subsumed in a, another discourse about corporate purpose. And, um, uh, and for those companies, there's all sorts of incentives about um, uh, the uh, identity of the company of having some kind of you know, ethical um, virtue which around which all the people who work for the company and the leadership of the company and the investors and so forth can celebrate and, and there's a story to be told. I mean the, I mean the best prob probably example of that would be uh, Unilever under Paul Polman for example. But um, uh, and for that purpose there's a kind of incentive to encourage people to be transparent and to go forth and that works very well for that end of the company. The trouble is, is, is Unilever, although it's huge, is actually just a quite a small part of the economy. And um, the although there is an argument, uh, which Stuart pointed out, that you, you can kind of imagine the economy consisting of these big companies and then everything else feeding up to the big companies. It doesn't quite work like that. And there's lots of uh, activity going on and lots of 
corporate activity, lots of buying, indeed lots of bond slavery, unfortunately, going on, which doesn't, you know, isn't to do with Unilever and similar companies. So that's a puzzle, and I don't know the answer to it. I guess from from my perspective, the carrot is the, 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 there are various carrots about, um, and one of them is um, if you're listed, uh, you will be concerned about your ESG scores. That is, you know, a, an unstoppable train, and businesses are concerned that if there are criticisms, if you are if you appear lower down in the corporate human rights benchmark, if there's a national contact point complaint made against you, for example. Um, that will hurt your ESG score. Um, I think in, in, in private party transactions um, in the context of say M&A, um, if uh, as a law firm we're advising a, a business acquiring another business uh, in the same way that you look at um, the anti-bribery procedures of the target entity that you're buying, we are now also looking at the human rights due diligence procedures and the, the quality of the Mon Slavery Act statement and also the, the Mon Slavery program behind that. And I'm not saying that at the moment that's something which is driving uh, corporate conduct, but it's worth noting that there is this evolution where um, businesses are being scrutinized by other businesses as part of other businesses due, to due diligence. And you want to, you know, when, they, when another business does its due diligence on you, you want to have good answers um, to the questions they, they raise. Thank you, Stuart. I'm going to jump in there because, although I said that was the last question, there is actually one other theme in our questions. And apologies to members of the audience who've asked questions which we haven't been, had time to put. Um, but there is one other theme which it would be remiss of us not to raise. Um, a number of questions have touched on the effects of COVID uh, on supply chains um, and on the increased risk of um, finding modern slavery in supply chains. And um, so a quick question to the panel, if we can make this the last question, um, are there any lessons to be learned that have been exposed by um, COVID uh, in terms of the inadequacy of the legal framework? Um, and are there any sort of specific um, measures in terms of improving that framework, which we could say, well, we've learned that lesson from our experiences during the pandemic? I, I'll go first. Um, so I would say that again, um, in, in our opinion, the Modern Slavery Act is, is, has too narrow a focus and we should be looking at all labor abuse. And I think that because so little abuse amounts to modern slavery, it's a very high threshold and it's dealt with in the criminal system. So what we need, I think, is to ensure that we have a much more resilient workforce and therefore more resilient supply chains by ensuring decent work for, for people. So that means wages, it means sick pay, especially during a pandemic. So you don't have people coming into work while ill because they cannot afford to stay home. Um, we need to ensure that they are able to secure and improve their own working conditions through collective bargaining and joining a union. So really ensuring that core enabling labor rights are protected and respected, or at least not suppressed um, is, is key to ensuring that um, we are much more able to withstand not just a human or a health crisis, but also a financial crisis like we had in 2008. Um, yes, I'll end there. Thank you. So I, I very much echo what Patricia said. Um, it, from sort of our perspective at ETI, it felt like COVID was uh, revealing or aggravating vulnerabilities that had already existed in supply chains. Um, um, particularly in, in countries where there is no so social safety net or, or a very inadequate one, where, as Patricia said, people can't afford to lose jobs um, because if they do, they then become instantly vulnerable to very severe forms of exploitation and modern slavery. Uh, and it's interesting reflecting on the work that my colleagues have done over the past year. A lot of it has been about very basic labour standards, occupational health and safety, freedom of association, uh, flagging risks that we've known for a long time about the vulnerability of migrant workers, for example. Um, so it wasn't new in a qualitative way, it was just much more severe and immediate and urgent because of COVID. Um, so I, I hope that it's kind of shed more light on those issues that are not necessarily new themselves um, and maybe created a bit more momentum towards addressing them. I guess I would only add one point, which is that um, the nature of 
human rights and modern slavery risk assessment and due diligence is that it's ongoing and um, COVID has changed the modern slavery risk profile in the supply chains of many businesses um, in terms of, um, for example, uh, the way that a huge percentage of, of workers in Bangladesh have, have been laid off, for example, and, and how will those work, you know, ultimately the, the vulnerability of certain workers in the supply chain, all of these issues are aggravated risks, which should be embedded into the ongoing risk assessment process for, for companies as, as we sort of emerge from the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, I haven't really got anything to add uh, uh, to what Stuart's just said there. Yeah, I guess we are living through a sort of natural experiment of seeing how companies respond to crises. And I think it is telling that there has been a, a kind of a bifurcation amongst, if you look at, for example, apparel companies, about those companies who've responded in a responsible way to the crisis with their supply base and those who haven't. And I think it tells you a lot about the, um, uh, the, uh, the way we should interpret corporate claims to corporate social responsibility when you see the firm respond in a crisis. I think that, uh, that tells you a great deal about whether we should trust what they say or not. Thank you very much, Steve. And I really must bring us to a close now. We've overshot by seven or eight minutes. Thank you very much indeed to all the members of the audience who've stayed with us um, past our um, end, advertised end time. I'd just like to thank once again, the Bonavero Institute for hosting this event. Uh, thanks again to our expert panelists for their extremely um, interesting reflections. Um, and just to mention one more time, the report that we've been discussing uh, is available on the website of the Modern Slavery Policy and Evidence Centre. That's www.modernslaverypec.org. Uh, you can download the report from there and a summary of it. And please just to also encourage you, uh, if you're interested in this area of work, to keep an eye on the work of the Policy and Evidence Centre. We're doing a lot of work in the area of supply chains. And as Lisa mentioned, we're hoping that this report will be the springboard to a lot of further work going on from here in this important area. So thank you all very much indeed. Uh, you can stay in touch with the Policy and Evidence Centre by signing up for website um, updates on the website. Um, we very much hope that we'll see you at a future event. Thank you all very much indeed. Goodbye.